Hello. Yeah. Uh, I am Abed. I work on accelerator solutions and architecture at Marvel Semiconductors. So we provide accelerated compute, networking, storage, and security solutions for the data infrastructure. And we have been doing this for quite some time. So major market segments that we, uh, our solutions find use in is like 5G carrier, enterprise networking, and security, automotive, and data center. So a recent trend is that all our data infrastructure related market segments have started transitioning and converging with the cloud, right? So the enterprise has become borderless, uh, automotive and 5G autonomous driving, they all need a cloud strategy. Uh, carrier infrastructure is going uh, towards virtual RAN and data center of course is leading this transition, right? So we have been addressing this convergence and uh, we are trying to enable what at Marvel we call the cloud optimized silicon era. So I'll start with the DPU first. So actually we are coming from the infrastructure side. Most of the talks here are targeted towards uh, application. So I'll just introduce this, what we call the DPU. Uh, so uh, modern DPUs or data processing units, uh, these are a successor to what we call the smart NIC. They consist of some general purpose CPUs, usually ARM in uh, most of the DPUs that are available in the market today, as well as a set of uh, workload accelerators. Uh, the accelerators are targeted towards accelerating data infrastructure, work infrastructure workloads. Usually all the packet transformation functions, flow processing, connection tracking, and there are other accelerations for compute intensive tasks like uh, cryptography, AIML inferencing, right? And these continue to grow. Like we initially, we used to have uh, just cryptographic accelerators. Now we have AI accelerators. Now we have specialized accelerator for other workloads. Uh, for carrier workloads, we have some accelerators uh, that are specialized, right? So, uh, uh, and on the general purpose ARM cores, and these are also becoming very powerful. So the Octeon consists of uh, like around six to 36 N2 cores on uh, the chip, on the card itself. And you can use these cores to run uh, general workloads that can run on Linux, right? So they all boot Linux, so you can run the Linux workloads. And to give an example, we are already able to run CNI and STO on the DPU itself. So that's something that we have been trying out. Uh, but that's not the in intention. The intention is to uh, use these accelerators, these specialized accelerators, right? And to give an example of what these accelerators can do today is that uh, even before the, any packet that comes on the wire, uh, even before it's, it reaches the ARM core, they can be de decrypted, detunneled, inner classified, and then they are given to the workloads, right? So there's already a lot of work that is done in line. And these are very power efficient. So just to give an example that we are able to do 50 Gbps of IPsec traffic in less than 15 watts, right? And uh, irrespective of packet size. And you're also, like we also do L2 to L4 processing in line. And lot of TLS uh, related workloads, lot of, uh, we already have, like, so, so Octeon has been used in lot of enterprise devices for uh, SSL gateways, for uh, intrusion detection systems, for routing uh, uh, solutions, uh, for the 5G solutions. So it's already uh, used in those segments. Uh, so why service mesh? A service mesh, uh, I, one of the definitions that's on the internet is like it's a ded dedicated infrastructure layer for making service to service communication safe, fast, and reliable. And it aligns with Marvel's goal, which is to move, store, process, and secure the world's data faster and more reliably. Uh, and ambient mesh is very interesting development for us, right? So we have been looking at cloud native for some time, and uh, what the sidecar was able to do was it was able to isolate the infrastructure workloads as part of the sidecar processing. Uh, ambient mesh is, has gone one step ahead and it's able to isolate it per node, right? So it, uh, because it's already isolated as part of specific uh, uh, compute uh, paradigm, so it would be very easy to transition it to separate compute element also. In this case, we are talking about DPU, right? So just to give an example, I've picked up this diagram from the um, iSolvent blog. 
and uh, we use this to make this. So uh, what we envision is that all the infrastructure common workloads can actually move or transition onto the DPU, which are more specialized to deal with these specialized kind of processing, right? And the processing can be anything. It can be policy lookups. It can be the cryptographic workloads, right? Uh, all those which the DP, DPU is more geared to more efficiently and more power uh, uh, to uh, handle in a more power efficient manner, those can be taken up by the DPU, right? So we have done some experiments in this regard, and Shatakshi here, as well as uh, uh, Garvit and Akhil in India, they've run some experiments with amb uh, ambient mesh, and we have come up with a prototype. So Shatakshi will go over that prototype uh, for the rest of the talk. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Atakshi. I'm a part of Marvel's Accelerator uh, Solution Team, and I'm looking into P4 programmable data planes, Kubernetes related solutions, CNI, load balancers, and etc. So, coming to the slide, we know that ambient mesh is a layered architecture where Istio functionalities are being distributed across the layers. And all the, data all the data plane functionalities previously were handled by the sidecar deployed per pod, but now they are being shifted to per node and per namespace basis. So the secure overlay layer, uh, Z-tunnel, Z -tunnel is present on every node. And uh, layer 7 has been handled by Waypoint, which, is like, uh, one, uh, which can be one or more per namespace and can be scalable according to the traffic demand. So as seen in the Gregory study published on solo.io blog, this architecture has eliminated almost like 90% uh, of the service mesh offload. So we also ran some tests. We executed an ambient mesh uh, setup with some basic functionalities and gathered some CPU utilization metrics. So these are our profiling and uh, synthetic test details. So we ran a virtual cluster. Traffic type was HTTP. We took two packet sizes, 1M and 1K. We enabled all the default features with MTLS, and it was a port-to-port -port packet transmission scenario. So now this is the case of when layer 4, uh, only layer 4 is enabled. So this graph is showing us so actually, this is the case where we have server pod on one node, client pod on another node, and both are in the same cluster. So here we can see that uh, roughly up to so the server node Z tunnel using up to 0.4 CPUs, client node Z tunnel using 0.35 CPUs. In the second case, when uh, packet size was 1M, we see 0.85 CPU utilized by the server node Z-Tunnel and 0.75 by the client node Z-Tunnel. This is the case when layer 7 and layer 4 was enabled. So similar case, two ports, two nodes, one cluster, one uh, waypoint proxy on that same cluster. So we saw that waypoint proxies resource utilization was up to 0.74 CPUs in the first case when the packet size was 1K, and the second case when the packet size was 1M, it was 0.69. So we have these numbers with the basic functionalities enabled. Now in future, when the functionalities and features of z -tunnel and waypoint will increase, these numbers may see further growth. So we are looking and exploring multiple architectures and models and ways to migrate these layers and their functionalities to the DPUs. Because modern DPUs support some functionality which are directly overlapping with the features supported by Z-Tunnel. And uh, DPUs have the capabilities to accelerate those functionalities. So our target is to eliminate the resource demand on the server nodes, freeing up them for the freeing up for uh, them to uh, so that they can serve additional uh, application workloads. We started similar kind of study earlier with Cilium, and uh, and uh, we are using our learnings from that model to come up with the similar design for the Istio ambient service mesh. We created a similar offload architecture for Cilium, where we were able to shift the CNI data path and the proxy 
totally onto the DPU. So first we'll go with uh, the same architecture. We'll go with the detail of this one. We are able to achieve this with Cilium. Uh, this is the detailed diagram of the full primary network offload on DPU. We have introduced some plugins to transparently offload the uh, CNI layer and its components onto the DPU. No changes to the Kubernetes port spec, uh, sorry, Kubernetes and application port spec as soon as the pod is being deployed. So let's go through the flow of this diagram. As soon as you deploy a user application pod, CRI will call the CNI in, in the same fashion as it does today to create an interface on the pod. Now our CNI offload layer, we're going to intercept that traffic and we're going to allocate an interface to your application pod. Now it will going to send details related to that interface to the plugin deployed on the DPU. Now that plugin will going to send the data to the CNI plugin in the exact way CRI does. And then CNI plugin will going to allocate the other side of the connection, will going to attach it to the eBPF data path, and this connection is via a virtual function pair. And this model is POC ready. We came up with the similar model for ambient mesh. This model is still in progress. We were able to run this model on virtual cluster by manually doing all the things, and we will going to automate the model. So similar to the previous diagram, we have introduced plugin to offload the architecture. So in this one also, uh, as soon as you deploy the user pod, the transmission of data between the CRI and the CNI will be intercepted by the CNI offload layer. Then this layer will going to allocate one interf uh, allocate an interface to your application pod and will going to send the data to the DPU via gRPC connection. So plugin will receive that data and plugin will then give all that data to the CNI plugin. And according to that, CNI will going to attach the other side of the interface to the data path. And everything will work in the same fashion. So we already, so it's like the last diagram which I showed is to shift Z tunnel onto the DPU. So why to leave Waypoint then? So Waypoint does all the layer seven processing work we know and uh, let's see how DPU can help in that. So DPUs have hardware blocks that can do policy enforcement. Layer seven policies can be accelerated using these specialized lookup blocks present on DPU, and similarly, DPUs provide crypto accelerators for any security and authorization protocols. So this is the final ambient mesh offload architecture where the whole data path and its functionality are being offloaded to the data processing units, where we can not only run CNI, but also Z tunnel, but also waypoint proxies on, onto the DPU. So instead of having Z tunnel on servers and dedicated nodes for Waypoint, we can offload all these components on DPU, which will be more beneficial for scaling them according to the increased de increase or decreased demand of the traffic. So, Abed, he'll come for the key takeaways. Yeah, so, uh, key takeaways, one, increased capacity, right? So, as of today, you can run CNI on the DPU as well. Uh, if you attach a DPU card, you can actually run application workloads also if you want. But if you are actually moving, transitioning the infrastructure workloads onto DPUs, you have more capacity on the servers to run those, right? Uh, there will be higher performance because DPUs are tuned for these workloads and uh, lower power and costs. Initially, we can use just the same eBPF data path as well as the IP tables data path also on the DPU uh, to have days, day zero uh, have this up and running. And slowly, we can transition into using those accelerators, which can be like the protocol accelerations for TLS, IPsec, more crypto workloads, policy lookups. Uh, those can uh, be transitioned one by one, right? And the target is to be ready for the future upcoming uh, compute requirements, uh, mainly like there will be uh, enhancements like quantum cryptographic algorithms will come, which will be, have a higher compute requirement thrown uh, at us. Uh, the new inter uh, Ethernet standards that are being defined uh, require a lot of hardware acceleration that would have, take a big toll on the server uh, resources if they are not offloaded, right? And of course, like AIML, we are seeing a uh, lot of new traction. So maybe in the next few years, there will be a lot of AIML-related 
workloads that would come on the networking as well. Having specialized accelerators take care of those will uh, free up our server workloads and give us a more uh, optimized cluster. Thank you. So if there are any questions, uh, we can take them. Thank you. Hi, thank you. This was very exciting. Uh, I was wondering, what is the current state? It sounded like some of these things are planned for the future. So where are you at with the current state? And is this something that's going to be publicly available? Can I get one and play with it? Or is it going to be sort of private work that Marvell is doing? No, we intend to open source uh, all the stuff that we do. In fact, uh, uh, these are models that we are developing. And we would lo love to hear the opinion of the community on that. So uh, we have already have a POC for Cilium. And hopefully for Istio also in the next few months, we'll try to come up with one POC, which we'll try to present and we'll uh, solicit comments on that. Yeah, and the DPU also it's available. Uh, there will be a uh, uh, COTS hardware that will be available that uh, uh, can be tried out. Right. Yeah. Tickets. All right. If there are no questions, uh, thank you. Hi, do you compare the performance uh, and networking uh, Istio compiles Cilium? Uh, <laughs> so we have not reached the stage where we can do those studies. I mean, it's in a very POC and very initial stage where we are first targeting the functionality move. And our initial aim is to actually get some framework where we can actually utilize the DPU, right? And that's what we are working towards. Once we have that, we will definitely work on more power and uh, uh, performance uh, comparisons. Uh, and I think uh, the, what we have seen from standalone, because we have been running these workloads, all these workloads, whether it's routing or uh, IPsec or TLS, we see a huge, huge performance uh, uh, difference when we uh, utilize the DPU. Yeah, of course, there are challenges in the models. The software models are not mature enough to utilize all the uh, accelerators as of now. And that's the target that we continuously work with the community. Uh, we've been trying to open source. Initially, uh, DPDK, VPP, these are uh, uh, frameworks which are able to utilize the accelerators to its full potential. Linux, as well as the cloud native, are not. I think there's still some software frameworks missing. And I think we will work to enhance that so that uh, all the accelerations can be utilized. And we'll start seeing those benefits. Awesome. Any other questions, folks? Um, if uh, you don't have a DPU laying around uh, at your workplace and you want to simulate this, try it out, what is the easiest path? Or so like, is there virtualization is for testing, or do you have to need the hardware at hand? So uh, currently, when we are doing development, we do it using virtual clusters, right? So I think the model can be dried out without the hardware as well. But to utilize the accelerations, uh, no, the simulation is not available. You'll need the hardware. Yes. I mean, there's in, there are in-house simulators, but it's not uh, publicly available. Yeah. Alrighty. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much.